Well, I'm kind of overwhelmed um, uh, by these uh, introductions. There weren't very many of them. <laughs> only, only four or five men. <laughs> but I, I, I really you know, was humbled by them, and I thank you. And just uh, to, to clear it up for you, uh, John, the grade average, 94, was straight A. And you can go from there. <laughs> also, uh, I appreciate the singing tonight and the playing, Steve and, uh, well, two Steves, right? Yeah, wonderful. And Steve, you're right. I, I do love uh, singing the old songs. You can ask Barbara. She'll tell you that on the way up here, she put a tape in our car uh, tape player, Andy Griffith songs, singing hymns, Andy Griffith singing hymns, and I sang bass with him all the way up here. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to tell you this, I'd rather listen to you sing any day than uh, Andy. Wonderful. We're all in uh, a good mood now for uh, continuing on. The message that I'm preaching is called the Peter Pan Syndrome, Churches and Christians Who Won't Grow Up. In 1904, there was a guy named uh, J.M. Barry who wrote a play called Peter Pan, The Boy Who Would Not Grow Up. And then in 1983, there was a man named Dan Kiley who wrote a book called the Peter Pan Syndrome, Men Who Have Never Grown Up. And then in 2016, Jack Cottrell wrote a sermon, The Peter Pan Syndrome, Christians and Churches Who Won't Grow Up. Now, the Peter Pan Syndrome, as it's widely known, is defined this way. It's a disorder in which a man is unable to grow into maturity or where people choose to hang on to their childhood to avoid assuming responsibility like a mature person. Well, my thesis uh, here is this, that despite the widespread emphasis on church growth and despite the, the uh, hype that's given to the so-called mega churches, there are just many, many, many churches, whether they have 50 members, 500 or 5,000, who are suffering from this Peter Pan syndrome. In other words, they need to grow up. And in many cases, if not most cases, it's the leaders of those churches, including the preacher, who are responsible for this immaturity because they themselves have not grown up. I don't know most of you, so I'm not uh, picking on anybody in uh, particular. In fact, I, I may be preaching to the choir here because maybe we all agree on this already and, it, and the problems that I'm going to be talking about don't even apply. Because after all, this is what, East Central Indiana? And that's, we talked about heaven, didn't we? We sang about heaven. And I, you know, I thought, Steve, while we were singing all those songs, I should have been preaching on heaven tonight. I got a sermon or two on heaven, I, but anyway, uh, I've always thought that east, central, and southern Indiana is about as close to heaven as you can get, and I say that even though I'm from Kentucky. <laughs> this message is about church growth. And I'm talking about the kind of church growth the Bible talks about. Uh, when most people hear that term church growth, they immediately think of numerical growth, mega churches as measured by numbers. I don't really see anything in the Bible about uh, numerical growth and the need to have that. I guess it's implied in the Great Commission, that is, we should keep bringing people in but it's not really specified as the goal that we should seek. 
But the New Testament does speak about church growth. But the question is, uh, what kind of church growth? That's my subject here tonight, and I'm taking my material from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 to 16. And what I'm going to read is mostly from the uh, uh, ESV version. And here's what it says. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning and by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. I'm going to uh, draw three points from this text. Uh, the first one we'll just call the church's job description. The church's job description. And you see this in verses 11 and 12. And here's what they said. He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ. It's those last words that I'm going to say is the church's job description. Our job is to build up the body of Christ. This is our mandate. This is uh, what we are expected to be doing. If this is a job description, uh, whose job is it? Who's responsible for this? Uh, I see here in these verses two layers of responsibility. Uh, the first is in verse 11, uh, which talks about church leaders that uh, the Lord himself has given or established. The leaders are the apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers. Now, my question here is, are you among this group? If so, you are one of the first layer of responsibility for causing the church to grow, to building it up as the body of Christ. So let me see, is, is anybody here an apostle? Anybody an apostle? How about a prophet? Anybody here a prophet? Now don't say, well, I am because I preach. That's false doctrine. Bible prophets are not the equivalent of preachers. Fact is, I'm glad to see nobody raise a hand because there are no prophets and apostles in our day. Those were first century uh, gifts to the church. Uh, the gift of uh, the office of apostle, the office of prophet, uh, they were given to lay the foundation for the church. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20 says that the church is actually built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. And that means on the teaching, the original oral teaching and preaching of the apostles and prophets. That's where the church uh, began to be built up. But not only that, it's the apostles and prophets that have given us the blueprints for the ongoing uh, building up uh, of the church. And the blueprints that they've given us are the New Testament writings. So the church is built upon the foundation of apostles and prophets. We don't have them anymore. But what about evangelists and shepherds and teachers? Anybody here an evangelist? Anybody? Do I see any hands at all? I see some. Uh, you know what? You're reluctant to hold your hand up because we don't really know for sure whether preachers are the same as evangelists. 
Uh, but I tell you this, if you're a preacher and are not doing the work of an evangelist, something's wrong. So I think uh, part of the work of the local preacher must be the work of evangelism. Uh, these are the ones that are kind of responsible for the numerical growth of the church, bringing in the sheaves. Uh, this is what we expect for the evangelist to do. But how, how about shepherds? Anybody here a shepherd? Oh, now the hands start to go up. Ah, oh, you know what that means, don't you? That's one of the elders of the church. Now, I don't know if you noticed when I was reading that scripture, I didn't say pastors. I said shepherds. Um, even though the ESV does not use the word shepherd, it says pastor. I changed it. I changed the Bible. Ah! <laughs> well, pastor and shepherd's the same thing. And in the Bible, the pastor is the elder, the pastors, elders. Now, <clears throat> this means that elders, you are part of the first layer of responsibility for building up the church in the way that it's supposed to be built up. And preachers, yes, I know, preachers do the kind of work that shepherds do a lot of times. My view is that if the preacher is qualified, he should be voted in to, uh, and be one of the elders of the church since he does a lot of that work anyway, uh, but only if he meets the qualifications and is accepted as such by the uh, rest of the congregation. How about uh, teachers? Anybody here teachers? All right, now everybody who raised their hands up for pastor should also raise your hand for teacher because these two are basically linked together in the text, pastors and teachers. But the pastors, the shepherds, are not the only teachers. There are other teachers, too. Now, what you're going to see in a moment is that it's the role of teaching, the gift of teachers, that probably is the most important gift for the building up of the body of Christ. Well, what is your specific job as the first layer of responsibility? Those who have these gifts of evangelists and shepherds and teachers, the Apostle Paul says specifically, your job is to equip the rest of the church to build up the church. To equip the saints. Anybody here a saint? You should, now, you're thinking of St. Teresa, you know, I'm talking about the way the Bible uses the word saint. Anybody here a saint? Every hand should go up. Every Christian is a saint. We've been set apart from the world, and that's what a saint is. Somebody who is holy in the sense of separated from the world. And it's the job of the leaders to equip you. Whether you have a leadership role or not, that's not the crucial thing. You, as one of the saints in the church, are to be equipped to do what? To build up the body of Christ. Building up the body. That's what our, all of our jobs are. I'm going to read those verses again. Notice, he gave the apostles and the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. Now, my second point out of this text is, what does that mean, to build up the body of Christ? Do, do, do you know, do you ever have this goal in life as you, when you were young or even older to be, to be a bodybuilder? You know, I noticed when we checked into our hotel down uh, t at uh, Newcastle, there's an exercise room right next to our room. I think my wife orchestrated that. <laughs> it was a hint of some kind. Well, when we think of bodybuilders, we have one image in our minds. But there's another image that's drawn for us here. We are all bodybuilders. Building up the body of Christ. Well, what is the goal when we are, what are we trying to accomplish? More muscles? 
No. Well, Paul specifically tells us in verse 13 and 14. I'm going to read those again now. He says, verse 12, that our job is to build up the body of Christ until, and here's the goal, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood. And that's the phrase I want you to remember. Mature manhood. To the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves, carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. So the goal here is mature manhood. In other words, grow up. This is the opposite of the Peter Pan syndrome, you see. Peter Pan syndrome says, never grow up, never grow up, never grow up. I don't want to grow up. But God says, grow up to mature manhood. Now, there's some things that uh, are not specified here. Paul is not specifying numerical growth, although that would be assumed. He's not specifying that mature manhood is achieved or church maturity is achieved by feeling good, by trying to get religious feelings in everybody, even though this is a very common approach to trying to build up the church these days. Let's have uh, congregational uh, uh, services where everybody can just uh, get the, these great feelings and have great experience. Well, you know, that's typical of children, isn't it? Children want to have fun. Children want to play. They want to have all these uh, experiences and, and to feel good. It's also a mark of our culture. Uh, it's very experience-oriented. And for some reason, some of us have made the assumption that that's what the church ought to be uh, providing because that's what people are seeking. Well, very often our, our congregations try to adjust themselves so that this happens, but... I don't think that's really what Paul has in mind here, and I won't go any further into it. Let me just focus on the thing that he specifies. Mature manhood is accomplished, he says, in terms of what we as a church teach and believe. It's what we teach and what we believe that signify whether we have reached maturity or not. Two things he specifically mentions there in verse 13. Until we attain, until we attain, this is our goal, this is what we're shooting for, this is what we're trying to accomplish, the unity of the faith and the unity of our knowledge of the Son of God. Mature manhood, maturity as a church involves having this, this unity of what we believe. And that specifically includes, first of all, unity of the faith. And this is one of those places in the New Testament where the word faith has the, uh, the uh, direct article or the specific article. No, yeah, article. Is that right? The I taught, you wouldn't believe it, but I taught uh, freshman English once at CCCBS. Uh, the article, the, this is not just faith. It's not just our inner faith, our feelings, and our uh, inner devotion. This is not unity of, of how we feel about Jesus. This is unity of the faith. And in the New Testament, when it talks about the faith, talking about what we believe to be true and what we teach to be true as the church. And this says we should have a unity of the faith. Now, people in the Restoration Movement, unity has always been a big deal. And it still is for most of us. We want unity. Jesus prayed for unity. But many times when we think of unity, we think of unity in spirit. And we think we're all united in spirit with the Christian world. Uh, and as long as we're united with them in spirit, that's what counts. As long as we can ha have this 
wonderful fellowship and this wonderful love for one another in the name of Jesus. That is the unity that God wants us to have. Well, that's not what Paul says. He says he wants us to grow up into, uh, through uh, the unity of faith, the faith. Now listen to how he puts it in 1 Corinthians 1.10. He says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another. Oh, man. Let's all take a test here, okay? I got a theology test. I, I want to give you a theology test. Let's just see if we all agree on everything. Well, here's the deal. We probably don't, but we should. That's what Paul is telling us here. That we should have a unity of the faith. Uh, that we should agree with one another in what you say, that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly un united in mind and thought. Not only do we have unity of the faith, but unity of the knowledge of the Son of God. Now here you could get into some of the more inner uh, side of our faith, knowledge of the Son of God, our faith in Jesus. And we should have unity in that. We should believe in the same Jesus, and we should believe the same things about Jesus. But that's like a starting point that grows until we have unity of the faith. Mature manhood comes about by pursuing sound doctrine, and in particular achieving unity in the knowledge of true doctrine. Folks, un until we have become unified in what we believe, in our understanding of Bible doctrine, we're still in a state of childhood, like Peter Pan. Because Paul says, unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God is how we get to mature manhood. The second thing he says that brings us to uh, maturity, uh, to mature manhood, and this is in verse 14, he says, so that we be no longer children. And what, what is characteristic of children? He goes on to explain in that verse, children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine. He's talking about false doctrines, false teachings, as he calls them, uh, human cunning and craftiness in deceitful schemes. He says you, you need to grow up so that you won't be children anymore when it comes to telling the difference between false doctrine and true doctrine. That's what he's telling us about here. That's what he's laying upon us. Maturity involves being able to distinguish between the truth and falsehood. How many people in your local congregation watch religious programs on TV? Maybe some of you do. And who do you watch? Who, who do your church members watch? There's just all kinds of evangelists, televangelists. John, I wrote some names down. John Ankerberg, uh, Reinhard Bonnke. Yeah, that's a real person. Uh, Kenneth Copeland, Creflo Dollar, John Hagee, Benny Hinn, T.D. Jakes, David Jeremiah, Hal Lindsey, Joyce, Joyce Meyer, Joel Osteen, Peter Popoff, and Charles Stanley. Whew. Who needs to go to church? Man. But when, when our people listen, if they do, to uh, evangelists like this and preachers like this on TV, do they know how to separate the wheat from the chaff? Do they really know how to distinguish falsehood from truth? If they don't, we've failed. Because it's our job in building up the church to help them distinguish between truth and falsehood. This means that you who are teachers and preachers uh, must need to know how to do this, that is, to separate truth from falsehood. And we must uh, specifically set forth an expose of current popular false teachings. How, how long has it been since you heard of any preacher preaching on why I am not a Baptist? or why I'm not a Methodist, or why I'm not a Presbyterian. And you could 
Catholic, you could go on. We, we don't, you go back earlier in the years, I, when I was a young man, listening to preachers and reading sermons that pre preachers preached, this was a common thing. But today we wouldn't touch that with a 10-foot pole because we don't want to make anybody mad. We don't want to offend anybody. And so we just leave the impression that we're all believing the same thing. Something's wrong here. I'm going to pause on this one for a while <clears throat> on the distinguishing truth from falsehood. While I'm talking about this, I'm going to have to say something about the current situation in the restoration movement. Like I said, I'm probably preaching to the choir here because, like I say, uh, th this part of Indiana is probably one of the most solid biblical and doctrinal uh, places in the whole planet. You can, you can give me a, a bonus for tonight for saying that. <laughs> but the, when I look out on the restoration movement as a whole, to a large extent, I believe we've lost our doctrinal bearings. We have become doctrinally soft and weak. In, in, in three main areas that I'm going to talk about here, for a little bit, I believe that many of us have gone over to the dark side. And the first one is how we view the Bible. I appreciate uh, in the introduction some of the comments about my commitment to the Bible. But I believe this is absolutely fundamental. What we believe this book is, is going to influence everything else we uh, say and do as Christians. If we don't believe that the Bible is the inspired, infallible Word of God, everything else is up for grabs. The traditional view of the Bible is, as I said, that it is verbally, that is, its very words, plenary, that is, the whole thing, is inspired by the Holy Spirit and therefore is without error. That's the traditional view. All Scripture is God-breathed, breathed out by God. In fact, Paul refers to the Old Testament Scriptures that were uh, entrusted to the Jews. And this is in Romans 3, verse 2. He says the Jews uh, were entrusted with the very words of God. That's what the Bible is in its original manuscript. But uh, just a little over 40 years ago, I know some of you aren't even 40 years old, but I, I was already at work, as many of you. A little over 40 years ago, right here in Indianapolis, Indiana, at a meeting uh, of the North American Christian Convention, I became aware that there are a number of people, even then, in our restoration movement, who no longer believed in the inerrancy of the Bible, that the Bible is fully inspired and without errors. I won't go into the history of that, but that was simply the beginning. Today, that doubt about Scripture that denial of the inspiration and infallibility of Scripture has grown in our movement, just as it has across the evangelical world. I'm going to give you an example of that, and uh, this breaks my heart. And that's uh, Cincinnati Christian University. Ever since 1924, uh, when it began, CCU has stood for the traditional view but I, I cannot guarantee that anymore. And this has nothing to do with the fact that uh, I was let go from the faculty there uh, just a month or two ago. That, that's, these are two things that, are, well, they are interconnected, but not how you, how you might think. Uh, I'm going to read you something from the original bylaws, the original bylaws of Cincinnati Christian University, Cincinnati Bible Seminary at that time. This is in Article 3 of the bylaws. 
Article 3 says, every trustee and teacher must be a member of the non-denominational fellowship of Christian churches and churches of Christ. Let me pause on that and tell you that's no longer true. And every member uh, and teacher, every trustee and teacher must believe without reservation in the full and final inspiration of the Bible. to the extent that it is to him the infallible word of God and therefore the all-sufficient rule of faith and life. Now there's more, but that's the part about the Bible. Something you may not be aware of is that last May, uh, a new board of trustees, uh, new in the sense that many of them had been replaced, wrote a new set of bylaws the old original bylaws for the Cincinnati Bible Seminary no longer exist. This is dated uh, May the 14th, 2015. And by the way, the original bylaws said that you could change anything about the bylaws except Article 3, which talked about what we believe and especially about the Bible. But the new... Uh, by the way, they changed it, you see, uh, contrary to the wish of those who wrote the original. But anyway, the new Article 3 sa says that uh, CCU shall make the Bible its chief textbook and arrange all of its courses of study and uh, conduct its work, conduct its work in harmony with the spirit and letter of the Word of God expressed in the Bible. End. The Word of God expressed in the Bible. That's all it says. Uh, I won't take more time than that, but that is a world away from what it used to say. If you want more on that, you should make sure you get a copy of the Restoration Herald, published by the CRA. Right, Paul? Amen. Paul Nichols. Uh, chairman of our board of trustees at the CRA, Christian Restoration Association, which is a faithful organization. But the, the February issue of the Restoration Herald has a, like an eight or ten page article by Lee Mason explaining what has happened at Cincinnati Christian University. And one of the things that's happened is the change of the bylaws and a watering down of the statement concerning the nature of the Bible. Also in that article by uh, Lee Mason in the Restoration Herald, he quotes a letter that was written to him by a student who was so upset with some, something that was being taught in our classroom, one of our classrooms, one of our teachers, at Cincinnati Christian University, a man who happens to be the chairman of the Bible department. And according to this student who had sat in his course, one of his courses, and who wrote this letter to Lee Mason, and whom Lee Mason quotes, I'm not giving you anything that's not already written in the Restoration Herald, this student, who was so concerned with what he had heard, he said, uh, I've spent much time in earnest prayer for the school during the time of significant transition. I've also thought back over my time as a grad student and realized that there may be certain incidents relevant to both CCU's abrupt shift in staff as well as your work of keeping the movement informed. He says, I want to tell you something that happened in the fall of 1913 when I was enrolled in Dr. Jamie Smith's early week class on Corinthians. In the class, while engaging a student, and this is another stu student, in intense dialogue over the course of the class, Smith proudly stated, in no uncertain terms, one, that he does not believe in absolute truth. Two, that the words of Paul's letters have no objective meaning. Three, he does not consider belief in the bodily resurrection of Christ as essential for Christian fellowship. Four, 
that he is a committed socialist and feminist. Five, that the restoration movement is long dead. After quickly glancing around the classroom and seeing most of the students' minds were disengaged, I made a point to ask Smith, why, why are all of us here if no one is able to understand Scripture and if the church movement has died? His only response was, the gospel. But then he proceeded to add that he believes our movement will soon be taking a significantly different shape. I guarantee you, uh, that's what is going on right now. And it's what's going on at CCU. I would like to say more about that, but I refer you to the article by Lee Mason in the Restoration Herald. Folks, when we change our view of the Bible and of truth itself, we can no longer even use the word truth meaningfully. We can no longer talk about sound doctrine. And we will never grow up. We will never reach that mature manhood. Why would uh, this professor, when he was asked, well, what are we even doing here if there is no absolute truth and if, you can't, if, if what Paul writes has no one specific meaning? And he says, the gospel, let me tell you what happens when a person gives up. And this is true across the board. I, I noticed this uh, when I was a doctoral student at Princeton. I, I noticed this from some of the students who were there. If you've given up your belief in the Bible as the Word of God, and what you're going to see is everything is, like I said a while ago, up for grabs. There's nothing that, uh, that is still sacred. But everybody wants to hold on to something about Christianity and Christian faith. And so even if they've given up on the Bible, what happens is that more often than not, a person will say, but I've got to hang on to Jesus. I've got to hang on to Jesus. And that's the gospel. Folks, um, that's not the biblical picture that we need to draw. The Bible, and I hope you don't think this is uh, impious, but the Bible is more than Jesus. The Bible does not start with Jesus. It starts with the creation. It starts with God in the beginning created the heavens and the earth. And He had created a, a universe that was never supposed to need redemption in the first place. It was supposed to be a perfect world. But he had given us free will. And Adam and Eve used their free will to sin. And so Jesus' work was necessary uh, through that contingency. But the Bible itself is more than just the message from and of and about Jesus. It's God's message to the world. And it talks about many things besides redemption and the gospel. The Bible, folks, is a world view. It has things to say about government. It has things to say about ethics. It has things to say about human nature. You could just go on and on. This is what the, the faith is all about. I, I had a man write to me back in the days when I was trying to uh, address our people uh, on the inerrancy question. This was back in the 1970s and 1980s. I'd written an article in the, rest, or, or, rather, in, in the uh, Christian Standard showing why inerrancy of the Bible is an important doctrine. I had a letter from a, a man who lived in Ohio, up around Columbus, I think, and he's, he really was reaming me out in his letter for writing that article about... You have no business telling people they should believe in the inerrancy of Scripture. There is no such thing as the inerrancy of Scripture. The only thing we need, the only thing we need to hold us together 
It's just the confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's it. And here are his words. Everything else is up for grabs. Now, he happened to say in that letter, I'm looking for a church here in Ohio. You can't imagine how much I hoped he would never get a church. Anywhere. If everything the Bible says, except Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, is up for grabs, we don't have Christianity anymore. Christianity is a worldview. How can we reach mature manhood with this kind of approach to the Bible? We can't, really. You can stick with Peter Pan if you want, but I'm going to go with Paul. I don't really have time here to develop these other two things I wanted to discuss. One of them is baptism. Uh, the second thing that we've got soft on, that we've got weak on, that we've given up on is the biblical view. And I'm not talking about everybody, but in so many cases, this is what has happened. The Bible teaching about baptism is that it is a work of God. It's something God is doing in the heart of the person who is being baptized. But this is not what the Christian evangelical world believes at all. They believe that God's already done whatever he's going to do as soon as the person believed. So what's happening in baptism? Well, in baptism, it's the person being baptized who's doing something. It's the person being baptized who is making a confession of his faith to the audience. It's the person being baptized who is demonstrating that he is a Christian just like everybody else. That is uh, an abandonment of the biblical view of baptism. You, and I, I, this is happening all over the place in the restoration movement. If you say, how do you know? Because I look at churches' websites. You, you look at churches' websites. Look at your own church's website and see what you find. And you look up what we believe. And under what we believe, see what it says about baptism. And see if it really indicates at all that baptism is where a person is saved by receiving this working of God. Colossians 2.12, we're buried with him in baptism. We're raised up with him in baptism in which um, through, through our faith. It's, in, it's through our faith, but it's in baptism. Through faith in what? Through faith in the working of God. Because that's what's going on in that moment. God's work. Don't give in to Peter Pan on baptism. Uh, grow up by preaching the clear biblical teaching on baptism. The third uh, category of false teaching that I wanted to touch on and just will mention is uh, gender roles. Now, I'm, I'm a great one for... Uh, alliteration in preaching. I love uh, alliteration. I, and I had uh, Bible and I had uh, baptism. I really wanted a B for this last point. But the only thing I could think of was babes. <laughs> and, and my wife warned me not to say anything like that. So, uh, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> but uh, what I'm talking about here is women preachers, women elders. Um, this movement of feminism started once absolute truth was given up. Because there, without understanding truth, especially from outside, from God, there is no reason in an evolutionary world why men should have different roles from women. And this is where the world is coming from. There should be no difference in roles between men and women. In the family, the feminist says uh, there is no submission and authority. Uh, men and women, husbands and wives have the same role. In the church, for those feminists who are in the church, women and men should be able to occupy the exact same roles. And... It was in the late, well, it was in the 1970s that this view started arising in evangelical Christendom. 
some of the first books on uh, feminism in the church, uh, women preachers and so on, were written in the 1970s. And it was in the late 70s, around 1980, that this concept also began to take root in the restoration movement. I know these things because uh, I was trying to stay on top of them, and I've written three books on the subject of gender roles. But today, in our day, um, feminism has gained the upper hand in our movement. You may not see it in your church, and I hope you don't, but in churches in general, in schools, um, women preachers is becoming the norm. You know what's going on in the North American Convention. You also probably know what's going on in some of our schools. Last year, the president of Ozark Christian College had an article in Christian Standard trying to defend the occasional preaching of women in the church and in church groups. Occasional, he says, not, not steady, but occasional. Folks, it was terrible scholarship. And I, I, I know some of the teachers, even at Ozark, that uh, regretted that that ever came out. But that has been a very influential article. I and a friend of mine wrote a response to it to show the bad scholarship and the terrible use of Greek that went, was behind that. But the Christian Standard refused to print our response uh, to uh, Matt Proctor's work. And that's prob that may be because the editor's daughter is one of the main feminist preachers uh, in our churches today. Cincinnati Christian University is uh, now feminist. Last spring, we had our first woman preach in chapel. She happens to be the wife of the man whom I quoted a while ago. Mandy Smith is her name, Jamie Smith's wife. She preached in chapel and was so received, just well received. Everybody loved it. Well, a lot did, not everybody. She also is a minister of one of the churches in Cincinnati, University Christian Church. This is our people, you see, and this is what's happening. Well, it's our job to distinguish between truth and falsehood. And I guarantee you, it won't make you popular. But if we're going to be disciples of Paul rather than Peter Pan we've got to make this distinction and speak out about not just what is true but also what is false the last point uh, from Ephesians is how do you achieve this goal how can we how can we achieve this unity of the faith and knowledge of Jesus and, and this uh, ability to distinguish between truth and falsehood and therefore build up the body of Christ, how can we do that? Paul says, and, and I can't talk about it, but he says, you do this in verse 15, by speaking the truth in love. Speaking the truth in love. This word, uh, speaking the truth, is actually just one word in Greek. Uh, and speaking the truth, one word. And I thought, we need, a, we need a single English word to represent that. And I thought about the word beautify. To beautify means to impose beauty on something or to fill something with beauty. I, I think about glorify, which when God glorifies us, he is filling us with his own glory. So I'm thinking this word ought to be called truthify. Truthify. Fill your sermons with truth. Fill your Sunday school classes with truth. And that includes not just speaking the sound doctrine, but showing what the false doctrine is. Titus 1.9 says, An elder has to hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able first to give instructions in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. Speak the truth in love. That's all I've got.